So good morning and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are, and uh, warm welcome to today's uh, webinar on antimicrobial resistance in Africa, um, progress and prospects. Uh, we are really delighted to have you join us for this insightful session brought to you by the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Global Health Network of the University of Oxford. Um, as we embark on this um, engaging discussion um, of the progress and the promising prospect regarding AMR within the African context, I would like to thank you once again uh, for you to you all for taking part in this important conversation in shaping the future of healthcare in Africa and beyond. So my name is Fauzia Mohamed. I work with Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on the Antimicrobial Resistance under the One Health Unit in the Surveillance and Disease Intelligence Division. And I will be your co-chair um, with Dr. Chifundo and will be privileged um, to host this uh, particular webinar today. Uh, we're also privileged to be joined by a distinguished panel of experts, um, each bringing invaluable expertise and experience um, in the field of healthcare and AMR. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Iwande Alimi, the One Health Unit Lead of Africa CDC, for her opening remarks, and Dr. Ryan Walker, who will provide the overview of the Global Health Network AMR Knowledge Hub and Community of Practice each five minutes and after that we'll have questions and answers and we'll move to the presentations from our panel um, of experts. Uh, Dr. Emiliana Francis from the Ministry of Health Tanzania, Julian representing React Africa will discuss innovative approaches to youth engagement in AMR. We'll have Dr. Leandre Ishema who will representing the Rwanda Biomedical Center who will discuss on one health approach in addressing AMR, emphasizing the interconnectedness of human, animal and the environmental health. Rwanda's experience. And finally, we'll have um, Stella Nanyonga from the University of Oxford, who will discuss optimizing antimicrobial use in the management of upper um, respiratory tract infections through antimicrobial stewardship in community pharmacy practices in Uganda, a patient-centered approach. So I'm um, really delightful to have all of them in this um, webinar today and their diverse expertise and contribution will enrich our understanding and drive um, hopefully a meaningful discourse on this critical issue affecting the healthcare system in Africa and globally. So um, up until that, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Iwande Alimi, who is the One Health Program Lead, Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, she has done incredible work and has been at the forefront in developing and implementing comprehensive strategies that bridge the gap between human, animal, and environmental health. Through her leadership, Africa CDC has established four key programs, on, um, including AMR, zoonotic disease, food safety, and climate change under the One Health Unit. Dr. Iwande also leads the implementation of several strategies in the African continent, including the African Union Framework, uh, for antimicrobial resistance and the Africa CDC's framework for one health practice for National Public Health, health Institute in member state countries. So I'm really delighted to invite Dr. Iwande to give her opening remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much and good morning uh, from warm city of Harare. Uh, I'm pleased to join you today. Um, I'm today I'm currently uh, in Harare. We are celebrating the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week with a walkathon. Uh, so I'm calling you all uh, joining in from the field. Uh, but allow me to express uh, uh, my gratitude to you all that have connected to, uh, to, to today's webinar. Uh, One Health and AMR uh, remains a priority for the African continent. Antimicrobial resistance um, is no longer what we call a silent threat. It is a threat right in our faces. We are living and experiencing it. However, it is worth highlighting the significant and remarkable progress that African countries have made. Over the past five years, um, African countries have made uh, significant efforts in developing and costing, as well as implementing their national action plans on antimicrobial resistance. We have a significant progress when it comes to AML surveillance, uh, and, and many of you may have seen our recent data coming from 14 countries uh, where we were able to do a multi-year, multi-country uh, retrospective data collection on antimicrobial resistance. Highlighting also significant progress made in the uh, agriculture and environmental health sectors. 
are really showcasing that one health approach that many of us call for. Today, I'm pleased to welcome you to this very uh, crucial uh, webinar where we sit back uh, and learn from many experts uh, coming in from Tanzania, from Uganda, uh, as well as Rwanda, as well as uh, a React Africa, uh, who will be speaking on, uh, on this panel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're joined by really um, 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 remarkable experts on the field, uh, many of them who I know and work very closely with. Uh, so I trust that you're in the best hands to really learn about the progress that the African continent has made. Nonetheless, we have made a significant progress, but there is still more work to do. Uh, for example, in the data which I reference, only 1.3% of, uh, of the countries are able to, of the bacteriology labs are able to conduct routine AST uh, with quality data. Similarly, many of our countries continue to report faulty, falsified and substandard medicines. Stewardship guidelines are still unavailable in many African countries. The issues of infection prevention and control, as well as wash, remains a crucial area that must be addressed. I'm hoping that this webinar will give us an opportunity as African countries, as global partners, to really look inward and identify homegrown solutions for us to be able to address antimicrobial resistance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again for joining us. And most importantly, I'd like to thank my colleague uh, Fozia, as well as the team from the Global Health Network for collaborating on um, 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 during this World Antimicrobial Awareness Week to really showcase the lessons learned um, in the African continent. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really delighted to join you today and I wish you a successful webinar. I'm back to you, Fozia. Thank you, Dr. Yawande. Um, once again, welcome everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Yawande, for those opening remarks. I, my name is Jifundram Soker. I'm a medical doctor working with the Global Health Network. And I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ryan Walker. And he is the project coordinator for the AMR Hub. Thank you, Chifundo. And I'd like to say it's an absolute pleasure to be joining this call uh, in collaboration with the Africa CDC today to talk about the vital issues that Dr. Yawande has just outlined concerning the immediate threat, not the silent threat, but the immediate threat of AMR, not just in Africa, but globally as well. As um, my colleague Jifundo has mentioned, my name is Dr. Ryan Walker. I'm a pharmacist by background, and I currently coordinate the Global Health Network's AMR community of practice and activities. And I'm going to give a short presentation this morning to give a little bit of background to the Global Health Network, uh, what we do as an organization, and with a particular focus on our AMR work as well. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Global Health Network, it operates as two highly, highly interconnected components. Um, essentially, it provides an online science park aiming to provide uh, research to support to areas where research is needed most and make the highest impact in areas of research inequity. Um, the, the network itself comprises of a park of online communities of practice, each dedicated to a particular scientific discipline, maybe a disease area or a particular research group. And the digital component provides a platform for the sharing of knowledge, the exchange of resources, and the exchange of learning materials dedicated to those particular scientific areas of focus and uh, uh, research. Behind this digital uh, aspect, there is a wide, uh, vast, diverse global network of uh, global researchers, all focusing on different areas of aspects of global health research. The Antimicrobial Resistance Hub makes up one of 60 different knowledge hubs that we have upon the Global Health Network at this time. As I've mentioned, behind the digital platform, there are different interconnected communities of researchers. So behind our AMR Knowledge Hub, there is a community of over 9,000 members globally. Now, this data is from June this year, so it's actually much likely to be closer to over 10,000 members globally at the moment, who are all part of this community dedicated to addressing uh, AMR and improving AMR research in settings where it doesn't happen. You can see on the left-hand side an overview of where the membership of this 10,000 strong community comes from. So you do see hotspots, for example, from the US and the UK. But I think when we focus on the Global South, we see some really exciting hotspots in, uh, for example, Nigeria and Kenya in Africa. Good uh, participation from uh, East Africa, also from India and China in Asia as well. 
and we're always looking to expand and grow the networks that we have. So we do encourage you to share and make use of the resources that we have on the AMR Knowledge Hub and share this with your colleagues, with your friends, with your partners in AMR um, and share some of the information and access the resources that we have on this space. Again, as you can see on the right hand side, you can see some of the top countries that we have our membership from include Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, Tanzania, South Africa, Ghana and Malawi. Just a quick overview of some of the enormous breadth of activities that we uh, support via the AMR Knowledge Hub on the Global Health Network. Primarily, as I've said, it's a space for the development of uh, dedicated resources and tools um, specific to AMR research. We aim to provide a one-stop shop for AMR researchers in general, again, supporting research in settings where it doesn't happen. Um, an example of where we've supported a partner in the development of AMR resources very recently is when we work with the WHO to um, digitize many of the aspects of their AWARE book, who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, the WHO antibiotic categorization. And we created an easily navigable space on the AMR hub to share a lot of the content from that book, working very closely with Mike Charland and the AWARE team at the WHO. In addition to supporting uh, collaborators and external partners, we also develop our own resources as well. So one of our sort of flagship resources is our regional AMR National Action Plan maps. You can see an example of the Africa National Action Plan map on the left hand side here. And this provides a space to one, identify which countries have existing national action plans, but also provide a research tool for researchers interested in, in policy and AMR um, national action plans to come and easily access all of those uh, national action plans in one space. And we have dedicated maps for Africa, Asia, and for Latin America and the Caribbean as well. We're always looking to expand our collaborative networks, both with um, AMR researchers and also partner organizations. Uh, my colleagues who uh, do a fantastic job of supporting the Knowledge Hub activities. So my colleague, uh, Godwin Pius Sohemu, who I think is on the call at the moment, leads a bi-weekly scoping of relevant uh, literature and training resources that we can find online to ensure everything and all the content that we have on the Hub is up to date and most relevant. And a sort of flagship example of an event that we've hosted recently is our Tackling AMR Hybrid Symposium. Some of you may well have been atten in attendance at this in Cape Town in uh, November last year. So this was a fantastic event that we hosted prior to the Global Health Network Conference. Uh, we had 155 participants from 29 countries, the vast majority of whom were based in LMICs. And the focus of this uh, symposium was tackling AMR through the One Health perspective. Uh, what was exciting was the diverse range of backgrounds and skills that were represented at the symposium, but also show the diverse range of uh, skills and experience that we have within the membership of the AMR Hub as well. So people from academia, from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, healthcare professionals, regulators, and crucially, people from the animal health and environmental health sector as well. Uh, it was a fantastic event, and we had two sessions of presentations in the morning, followed by uh, an afternoon of interactive breakout sessions. A quick overview of our future plans for the AMR Hub. So we're always looking to develop new training and e-learning materials. In particular, a lot of the feedback that we get is that the e-learning uh, aspect of what we do is one of the most valuable for our members. So we're looking to develop targeted e-learning uh, based on review and feedback of our member and collaborator needs as well. Uh, we want to increase engagement and involvement in the Knowledge Hub activities from the community of practice members. Um, some of you may have been involved in the recent meet and greet events that we've been hosting to allow people to, to meet other researchers in their area, other AMR researchers, and hopefully identify areas of cross-cutting need in AMR research as well. Um, and we want to take a more proactive approach to sharing the vast amount of information, the vast amount of resources and things like funding opportunities that we have on the Hub at the moment through dissemination via uh, newsletters, via social media and other activities as well. And of course, we're also always looking to hold fantastic events, for example, like this event today uh, with the Africa CDC and potentially a repeat in-person symposium in 2024. Um, just a quick sort of overview of our future and, well, our current and future collaborations. So we're working very closely with the British Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy at the moment to develop, as I said, targeted e-learning and training materials. I've mentioned the WHO and the work we've done with them on the AWARE book. Uh, we're also working with the Adila Group, so that's the AMR data to inform local action based at St. George's University in the UK. And they have an enormous amount of uh, AMR material that we're working with them to develop into um, 
e-learning and training resources. And an example here of a group that we're hoping to work with more closely in Africa, the Nyanza Reproductive Health Society. And hopefully we're, make, we're uh, hoping to create a dedicated space for uh, AMR in sexually transmitted infections on the AMR hub as well. Um, as I've mentioned, we've recently been hosting some meet and greet events. Um, the outcomes of these events, uh, which were very informal, and as I said, provided an opportunity for people to meet and share potential ideas for research collaboration and collaborative funding proposals. We're hoping to launch some international working groups based on the outcomes of those discussions in the coming weeks. And we'll be in touch with everyone who is a member of the AMR Hub to uh, feed back on the impacts of those discussions very shortly. So if you're not a member at the moment, I encourage you to join. And I'm sure we'll drop a link in the chat about how you can join as well. So that's everything from me. I'm uh, very happy to take questions and comments on uh, TJHN's AMR work and initiatives throughout the call. And I'd like to say thank you once again to Chifundo and to Fosia for chairing this meeting. And I look forward to the rest of the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan. We really appreciated that insightful presentation. Um, to this end, I would like to give um, three minutes to our participants um, to ask questions to the first two speakers, especially Dr. Aaron. Over to you, dear participants. Just want to say, Fozi, I've just seen uh, a request to share my email, so I'll just put it in the chat as well in case anyone would like to follow up afterwards. Um, and what I will say is, um, Whilst we do a sort of bi-weekly scoping to ensure that all of the materials, the training materials, the resources, SOPs, guidelines that we put on the hub are entirely up to date and relevant, um, if uh, sort of the, the greatest value that we, we find in the resources that we share are resources that people share with us. So if anyone has, if anyone in the meeting has uh, any sort of training material, whether that's a presentation, a guideline that they feel may be of use to other groups doing AMR research, please do get in touch because we'd be more than happy to share it on the space, uh, on the AMR Hub. Oh, well, perfect. Um, yeah, there's a question already. Um, thank you for this insightful presentation. How can a country engage with you to develop this AMR National Action Plan in a standardized way? Um, that question is directed, I think, to both <laughs> Dr. Ryan, if we may take this one, because Dr. Ryan, when they are strong. That's a fantastic question. I have to say, I think it's a question perhaps for the Africa CDC to respond to on on the master policy. Um, uh, is Yuande still on the call, Fozi, or has she moved on? Sure. Um, I, Dr. Wende has dropped off, but I can answer since I work on sure. this program. Yeah, please. Well. Um, yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. I'm just uh, curious where the question is coming from, like which country, because uh, that's not been indicated here, but we do support um, national action plan development and also capacity building and in implementation in the 55 AU member state countries. Um, of course, in close uh, collaboration with our partners, including the WHO um, REACT, uh, Dr. Julian is also here. Um, so yeah, we do support once we get that kind of request, um, we kickstart on how best we can support our countries in that regard. So I don't know where the question is coming from, but thank you so much for that. Um, moving to the next question, what is the representation of Francophone, Lusophone members and collaborations? Are you capturing those countries? It's a fantastic question, Fozi, a really important question. So as you saw from the map, most of the uh, engagement that we have in TGHN's activities at the moment, in our AMR activities, is from Anglophone countries. And we're always looking to expand the support and the materials that we can offer for uh, members in Francophone and in Lusophone countries. Um, we are coordinated by a largely Anglophone group. I'm afraid my personal language skills are not fantastic outside of English, but we there is a translate function on the Global Health Network that allows a translation of much of the written material into French mm -hmm. and Spanish and Portuguese. Um, what we also are constantly trying to um, invite, again, is input and sharing of Francophone and Lusophone resources to ensure that we're supporting the Francophone and Lusophone communities. So yes, it's definitely an area that we're looking to expand and an area that we're looking to continue to support. And it's a highly important area as well. Yeah, thank you so much. I think I see from uh, the first question was from Benin Republic. So um, I will leave you with my email so you can reach out so that you can start that discussion on how best we can support the national action plan. There are quite a number of other questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Ryan, for the presentation. How can individuals contribute to the AMR national action plan? This is from Uganda. Now, this is directed to you. 
how can individuals contribute to the AMR National Action Plan? Again, um, I I might um, re refer this question to the Africa CDC on the matters of policy. What what we would encourage in the term in the work that we do, because we share and provide easy access to the existing national action plans, is that if there are policymakers, if there are people working on national action plans on the call. Um, to get in touch with us, to check the resources that we have already, and let us know if there are any gaps in what we have, because we're always looking to make sure that these are the highly relevant materials of most value to AMR researchers. So in terms of developing national action plans, again, I wouldn't want to comment as I'm not a policymaking expert, but if you work in that space, I absolutely invite people to get in touch, to point us in the right direction of things that we should be sharing, and to help us make sure that the, the quality of the materials and the resources that we provide are of uh, greatest value to AMR researchers resources researchers sorry uh, yeah I, I think I, I will just post this um I will only do this question um that is hopefully we can be we will answer them <laughs> later because we don't have time um how can we collaborate in the area of AMR studies is there any support from presenters um, we are always looking to collaborate at the Global Health Network and it's fantastic to be working with the Africa CDC today I would say mm -hmm. if you'd like to collaborate please get in touch. I've dropped my email in the chat. Um, I'd say what will be useful is an overview of the area of AMR work that you work in and what you'd like to do. But absolutely do get in touch because we're always looking to build these collaborative networks. As I've said, we're also hoping to launch these international working groups over the next few weeks. Um, so do get involved with those as well. They're going to focus on different areas of AMR research, most likely uh, surveillance and antimicrobial stewardship as well. Um, so yes, please do reach out at any point. As I said, my email's in the chat and we're always excited and happy to collaborate. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible um, in the chat box. So um, just bear with us that we don't have time. Thank you so much, Ryan, for taking time to answer those questions. Um, I would like to move to our presenters. Um, I would like to introduce our next presenter for this session, um, Dr. Emiliana. Uh, Francis from the Ministry of Health, Tanzania. She's a pharmacist and has worked at the Ministry of Health and the Pharmaceutical Services Unit since 2014. Dr. Emiliana is a specialist in pharmaceutical policy, particularly standard treatment guidelines and the essential medicine list. She's also an expert on antimicrobial systems and country coordinator for the antimicrobial systems responsible for coordinating AMR activities nationwide, including implementation of the National Action Plan for AMR. She is also the Secretariat of the National Multisectoral Coordination Committee on Antimicrobial Resistance, and she is also the Secretary of the National Technical Working Group on Antimicrobial Stewardship. Thank you so much, Dr. Emiliana, for joining us and for honoring our invite to speak in our webinar. And thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Emiliana. Thank you, Fodia, and thank you, everyone, who has joined this, the, this Zoom meeting. Uh, as Dr. Fauzia introduced me, I'm Emiliana Francis from Ministry of Health Tanzania. I will take you through on the antimicrobial resistance surveillance in Tanzania, on the progress that we have made in combating AMR in terms of uh, AMR surveillance, uh, what are the challenges that we are facing, and the prospects in monitoring the resistance patterns in human population. This is the outline. I will take you through the burden of MR in Tanzania, MR surveillance, the progress of AMR surveillance, with linking with the National Action Plan on AMR 2023-2028. We just see the conclusion challenges and the future prospects. Uh, as you can see, um, this is the status of AMR in Tanzania. The study which was conducted in 2019, it was revealed that 12,500 deaths were attributed to AMR and 54 deaths were associated with AMR. You can see how the bigger impact is in our country. And also the AMR attribute the blood screen infection death in 6% in children with under 5 years, but also the 4 to 13 in neonates. But also the surveillance which was done in pregnant human, it revealed that 13 to 17 percent of the pregnant women have urinary tract infections. We are also uh, we are also facing the the problem of surgical site infection for post cesarean section, which is approximately of 10 to 49 percent. Developed the SSCI 
after post cesarean and this is associated with longer duration of hospital stay uh, these are are the MR surveillance requests in, a, in a, our country. We have human resources. Uh, we have like 10, uh, 10 microbiology, which has been trained on the AMR. We have uh, 46. Uh, we have nine epidemiology on the AMR cell at the country level. We have like three MR surveillance experts. The Antimicrobial use surveillance are uh, three, and the AMR surveillance, a AMR police, we had we had one. Uh, in total, we have like twenty six AMR, a AMR fellows, as I as I have explained in various fields as part of human resource capacity building. This was done through framing fund fell was fellows, and this. This AMR expert has extended the knowledge in other in other in other expert in the country. Now we have like a two hundred experts on the AMR surveillance. On the materials, we have the guidelines which guide on the AMR surveillance in the country. We have the national action plan which stipulate the strategic objective of the AMR surveillance the research and. The, lab capacity and the activities associated which can be performed to the country under the AMR surveillance component. We have also the national action, the national antimicrobial resistance surveillance, which is to place the priority pathogen and the priority sample for the AMR surveillance in the country, as well as the regional one, which is supposed to be submitted to the GAS as per WHO recommendation. We have also other guidelines which help the implementation of AMR surveillance in the country. In terms of material resources, we have AMR sites with diagnostic in infrastructures which help in uh, producing the AMR data in the country. We have nine sentinel sites. We, these, are, these are tertiary hospital and the regional, which are secondary hospitals which produce the AMR data in the country. The plan is to add three more hospitals. The problem here is that we have not extended this uh, MR surveillance program to the primary health care facilities. As I said earlier that we are performing a lot on the AMR surveillance in our country, this is one of the example on the resistance pattern of E. coli among pregnant women with UTI in the referral system. This was done in part of uh, one of the part of the Tanzanian called the Mwanza. This study was carried through uh, between 2016 and May 2017, uh, involved the, the number of patients 1,828. We took the midstream urine samples for the culture and sensitivity. As you can see, that it is, you, you can see the results show that the ampiclock, the cotrimoxazoles, show the significant resistance in among of the hospitals, which are the, the HC, the health center, which is the, is the primary level, and the, the one which is the, which is uh, in the, which is indicated in green one, the uh, the one which is uh, in in blue, it is the prime, the, it is the secondary secondary referral hospitals, and the one which is ready, it is the tertiary hospitals. You show you see that all it is, all this medication shows the resistance across these levels of hospitals, and the we see the nitrofurantoin and Gentamicin and the SDL, they just show a good, uh, a, a, a good, uh, a good significant in treating the UTI, which is associated with Escherichia coli. We use this data in reviewing our uh, national standard treatment guideline for the ur urinary tract infection. This is one also of the hospital-based AMR surveillance. Also, this was in the same region in Mwanza. This is a finding from SNAP MRA project. 
which is the involved a total of 2,316 patients, which were admitted in five hospitals, which are primary hospitals, secondary, and the tertiary hospitals. As you can see, this was a survey of between 2019 to 2020 on bloodstream infection, soft tissue infection, and the urinary tract infection. The general finding was that approximately 8 to 54 of these infections were due to hysteresis, E. coli, and the Klebsiella pneumonia. The study also revealed that uh, the cell generation cephalosporin revealed the cell generation cephalosporin resistance in gram negative bacteria by, sim by sample types and the level of healthcare facilities. And you can see that the, the third generation were, were sensitive in the district in the district hospital, it's like a primary hospital in our country, and their resistance, a, a remarkable resistance in remarkable resistance in secondary hospital and tertiary hospitals, which emphasize a which emphasize a critical need to prepare the standard treatment guideline as far hospital level. Uh, Tanzania has been has been one of the country which has uh, enrolled and the reporting the AMR and the AMC data into GRASS platform. The, we started submitting the AMC data since 2019 and the AMR data we started to submit in 2020. This is the AMR surveillance data submission to the National Public Health Lab and the WHO for last trend from 2020 to 2022. We have, as I said, we have nine sentinel sites which this sentinel site uh, report or submit the MR data to the to the national national hub of MR data at the national public health laboratory. And this national health public health laboratory is the one in which validates this data and we submit the data to the WHO class. You can see there is a trend of increasing of the there is there have been a trend of increasing of AMR data since we started since we started the reporting to the GRASS from 2021 to 2022 for the specific, uh, for the specific sample of urine and the blood. Uh, this is the contribution of the hospitals by the number of samples which are produced, number of, uh, of AMR data which are produced by specific sentinel sites. As you can see, the above three hospitals, these are tertiary hospitals, and they have been uh, one of the hospitals which are, are producing a large number of AMR data, which we submit to the to the WHO in the in the glass platform. This is the contribution of clinical sample data submission to National Public Health Laboratory by hospitals in January to December 2020. As you can see, this is the distribution by age. We see that the under five are uh, the one with which are contributed more data compared to other ages. This is this, a trend of WHO priority pathogen from urine and blood samples from, 20, from the year of 2022 to 2023. You can see there is a significant of increase of data from where we started reporting to the GRASS up to this time, we have contributed to that much. And when you visit the GRASS platform, you will see our data of AMR surveillance are all there. This is the submission of AMC data to the global platform. As I said, we started to submit the AMC data to the global platform since 2017. As you can see, there, are, there have been, a, from the data of what we have been submitting to the GLASS platform, there is, a, there is a significant decrease of the DDD per 100 per, per, per thousand inhabitants since we started in 2017 to 2022. So the, what is this data telling us about? This data, it is telling that 
Tanzania we have been uh, we have been we have a commendable uh, antimicrobial stewardship program in the country which has led to decrease of the DDD of 136 from 2017 to 40 to 44 into 2022 so we have made a, a really good progress on the stewardship to to rationalize the use of the antimicrobials in our country this is the one of the this one of the example of the national antibiogram which were generated from the AMR data from urine and blood samples which are generated by generated by the sentinel site and this national uh, national antibiogram it guides the empirical treatment of infections from urine and the blood infection this is one also of the this is one also of the uh, antibiogram from the one of the sentinel site and this uh, antibiogram, it helped the specific hospital to generate a local guideline for treatment of, for empirical treatment of the infection within the, within the hospital. This, uh, this uh, I want to emphasize on the significance of AMR data in Tanzania. We generate a lot of data of AMR data in Tanzania, as I have showed you earlier. Uh, but what are we using? this data for. We use the data to, to review our national guidelines as well as our hospital level guidelines. All this has the impact for, for improving patient quality of treatment and the host of the community health. Uh, Tanzania was one of the one of the countries which has recently undergone the second JEE and as 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 I told you earlier, that we started implementing the AMR activities in 2017, and we undergone the we undergone the first JE in 2016. Now I will, I will show you the the results of 2016 and the results that we we got, which were re-evaluated by WHO JEE which we we which was the JE was conducted in twenty in twenty in this year twenty twenty three in October. As you can see uh, in the previous JEE of the first JE in twenty sixteen, we in the in the AMR surveillance we we got we scored one. That means no capacity. Now we are going to see the second JE in 20, 20, 2023. What progress have we made in terms of the AMR surveillance? As you can see, on the on the on the AMR surveillance, we scored it. surveillance of AMR we scored level four. But if there was another indicator. This was a new indicator in the tool, the prevention of MDRO that we scored one. And we scored one, it is not that we don't have capacity of, uh, of conducting or detecting and preventing the MDRO. We have all the capacity. That what was, was missing is a unified system to detect this, uh, this MDRO and the reporting. But also, in our every, everything or every, uh, every activity of AMR surveillance in our country, it is guided by the AMR surveillance framework. So this uh, detection, identification, and detection and the reporting of the MDRO were not included in our AMR surveillance framework. And now we are in the process of reviewing our framework and include the MDRO part in the in the guideline. Um, in conclusion, there is a commendable progress in the AMR surveillance implementation activity in Tanzania. As we have seen, the development of all key guidelines and the capacity building to staff has been done. There is a remarkable increase in performance indicator by WHO class and the JE evaluation. Also, the utilization of, gener of generated data to guide treatment guidelines has slowly started to be implemented. 
There are also ongoing training and the capacity building to start engaging in AMR surveillance. Uh, we have the PAS, we have the hospital, the hospital based capacity building, the lab based capacity building, and the, also the the online online session like Echo, which are which are going on for 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 creating the or for 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 building up the capacity for staff to detect it and report the AMR the country. The challenges that we are facing on the implementation of AMR surveillance is financial constraints for rolling out AMR surveillance program. As you can see, we we have only managed to to enroll this AMR surveillance program in nine Sentinel hospitals out of the 41 hospitals which are stipulated in the AMR surveillance framework guideline. We also have a limited, limited utilization of generated AMR surveillance data due to limited analytical skills and also some also another limitation is on the behavior the behavioral issues. AMR surveillance is entirely based on a phenotypic method, limited to track transmission dynamics within and across hospital, and they also detect the outbreak reliably. These are the future prospects. Capitalizing AMR surveillance data utilization to improve patient outcome. This is through fostering awareness and focus among healthcare workers, patients, communities, and all actors, cascading implementation activity to some national level, especially to primary healthcare and more engagement of private hospitals, leveraging local funding mechanism at ministry and the institution level to ensure sustainability. We are now on the process of uh, we are now in uh, the process of establishing of the universal health coverage system, which we will, which will cover most of the the access to antimicrobials for the patients, and as well as the test for AST, which is a big challenge now for the for the most of the patient to pay on their on, to pay from the from the pocket. We are also focusing on establishing the genomic AMR surveillance at, at the National Public Health Reference Lab and the other lab which have capacity of doing that test, like the National, National Hospital. Thank you for listening. This marks the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Emiliana Francis, for that informative presentation. Um, we will hold question and answers for the end of the session. I would now like to introduce my our next speaker, um, Julian Nyamu Pachitu. And she is a public health and monitoring and evaluation specialist currently working with React Africa. Um, she oversees and manages AMR projects across the Sub-Saharan uh, African region, working with both ang Anglophone and uh, Francophone countries. And she's passionate about engaging with the youth in addressing critical issues in AMR. Um, through her leadership uh, of the React Africa Youth Engagement Program, she coordinates a range of activities building um, capacity and raising awareness among tertiary level students. Welcome, Dr. Julian. Dr. Julian, um, we're pleased to have you. Thank you so much, uh, Chifundo, uh, for the kind introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be here um, to talk about some work that React Africa has been doing for a key stakeholder group that I'm particularly personally passionate about, the youth. So, so um, I'll briefly introduce REACT. Um, REACT is Action on Antibiotic Resistance, and we are a global network 
represented in Europe, um, Uppsala University in Sweden, where our headquarters is, and we also have representation in Latin America, Southeast um, Asia region, and also in Africa. So um, we actually work with um, different stakeholders using a One Health approach, and we are a global catalyst um, that is that, that we act, that actually works to advocate and stimulate uh, global engagement on antimicrobial resistance. Particularly in React Africa, we engage with countries to support um, implementation of their national action plans. So we have worked with quite a number of countries in the African region to support um, the implementation of their national action plans. And we also work very closely with the regional quadrupartite, including Africa CDC in the different um, initiatives that we do in AMR mitigation. Um, I think I won't labor much on this slide. Um, it's just further emphasizing that uh, indeed AMR is a global health threat. We need to act. Um, the previous speaker from Tanzania shed light into, I actually like the fact that she referred to the country statistics that actually show that uh, it's a problem in Tanzania. And you saw the increase even as she was going through uh, the surveillance data that they have collected um, in the country. So really, um, the fact that it is a problem means that we should engage uh, a lot of stakeholders, and this includes the youth, which is just the focus of my presentation uh, today. Uh, if you look at this slide here, the Gram study, which we are all aware of um, in 2019, actually shows that now AMR is causing more deaths, more than even HIV, AIDS, and uh, malaria. So really, it's not a silent pandemic, but it's actually an ongoing one, which mandates us to take action. So why youth? Um, why are youth important in uh, engaging them in this, um, in mitigating AMR? As you know, they are the next generation of um, public health professionals. They are the next generation of uh, potentially maybe policymakers. They are the next generation of even communication specialists. As we know, AMR is a multi-sectorial problem. So it will be very important to ensure that uh, the future, because as you see, it's only getting worse. It's only getting incrementally worse. So it is important that the generation that is young at this point, we make sure that as they transition into their professional careers, as they grow older, they understand that this is a global health threat that needs them to change behavior, that need them to be aware, even if they are to be the future public health um, experts, they know that as a doctor, when I'm prescribing, what is antimicrobial stewardship, how should I ensure that um, I make sure that uh, I, I don't just prescribe antibiotics, but I make uh, informed decisions. I practice good antimicrobial stewardship. Even when it comes to matters communication, how do we make sure the communication experts coming up do not not only know about, say, HIV, which is the one that uh, most media people would know? How do they? How do we make sure when they're in school, they also appreciate that uh, amongst the top 10 global health threats, there is also antimicrobial resistance? Uh, the next slide um, also focuses on just specifically why the youth um, need to be engaged. In Africa, just the demographic significance is that uh, youth actually represent a significant portion of the population in Africa. So it is important that they are engaged and at the right time. They are key agents of change. Youth actually possess immense potential to be change agents in their society. They've got the energy, they've got the passion, they've got innovative thinking and can drive um, various awareness campaigns. In addition to that, uh, looking at the fact that um, AMR is only getting worse, we need to do something, we need to act. And it's a long-term challenge that will impact the future, the 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 few the future of these youth currently. If you look at the projections that are there, that say by 2050, we'll be having 10 million deaths annually. So it means that the youth really need to know that by the time I'm this age, maybe some of us will have gone by that time. But you know, when the youth are coming in, they need to appreciate what a problem it is so that they'll be able to at least make a difference. 
and they do have unique perspectives. They bring fresh perspectives uh, to this uh, global health threat and also have a significant influence on their peers, their families. And because they are in educational institutions, it's easier to target them because you target a larger percentage of um, people. If you go to say a university, a college to try and talk about AMR and they can also do peer to peer knowledge sharing, which is very important. There's also the point of youth led advocacy. Um, youth are actually keen on also starting their own initiatives, looking at the current innovative uh, practices of how they can actually influence policy in their different settings. And also have, um, it will be important also to have the youth perspectives included in the various AMR uh, strategies. So what we have been doing as React Africa, we target youth right from the primary school level. So at the primary school level, um, we piloted some uh, a project that targeted um, here in Kenya, two counties in Kisumu and Siaya counties um, in Kenya, that's at the sub-national level. So what we did is our colleagues from React Latin America had come up with a booklet that was targeting uh, the school children at the primary school uh, level. So we contextualized that to the African context, specifically Kenya, translated it because it was a Spanish booklet. And then it's very, um, it's got a lot of uh, pictorial, and very relevant for that uh, level. And we used the child to child methodology to actually have them have clubs led by teachers that had been trained before. And it was actually good because this the children ended up understanding that uh, AMR is a problem. Of course, the angle we used was mostly coming from the angle of good hand hygiene practices. And there were contests, they were challenged to do some drawings, trying to understand that uh, what are the best practices and all. And in addition to that, uh, we did have installation of tippy taps in the pictures that you see at the bottom right there. Um, it's just a tap that you can press uh, there and then water can come out from just a simple container. And this is actually good in terms of hand hygiene practices. They came up with songs in one of the years during the WOW week. And as you know, November 19 is also World Toilet Day. So we used the wash angle as well to try and make sure that they understand uh, that by doing just small interventions in their families, in their communities, they can actually be able to help in AMR prevention. So moving on from the primary school, in terms of the tertiary level students, we have been engaging them for quite uh, some time. But in 2021, we then thought it would be important to have a more structured way of engaging the youth. Um, so we started um, we piloted a program and we partnered with Students Against Superbugs Africa, which is a youth-led initiative from here in Kenya, where I am resident. And then we, with a goal to have uh, empowered student leaders in Africa who are problem solvers and solution providers to the AMR threat. So what we did is we put out a call Students applied and we selected um, about 100 students from eight different countries. We had an official launch where we invited the regional quadrupartite to be there. Dr. Yan Wande, who just spoke earlier from the Africa CDC, was also part of that launch. And it was good because they actually inspired the youth as they started uh, this program. Most of our students came from Uganda and we also had representation from other countries. So the methodology we used for this pilot program, which is um, really a flagship program for React Africa, is that we, we had these students start with an online course. Uh, we do have an online course on our React website. So they went through the course materials uh, there. And following that, we had a discussion, we had a review of it. And we were meeting with these youth champions every single Saturday for a period of six months. So after they had finished their online course, we went on to have sessions now coming from different experts. We used the One Health approach. So we focused on the policy angle, 
which are the national action plans in the countries? How do they as youth leaders uh, engage at the policy level, at the country level? What is happening with their national action plans? We also had experts come in, talk about uh, AMR and sustainable food systems, AMR and the environment from a One Health uh, perspective. In a, so this slide just shows some of the flyers and the various speakers we, we invited to these sessions. And we also had, in addition to the technical aspects of AMR, uh, we looked at the soft skills as well, because if these people are supposed to be leaders who know how to mobilize the action, it's important that they also know about issues around design thinking, systems thinking, project management, monitoring and evaluation. And so we also had uh, speakers coming in to also engage, talk to them about uh, the soft skills so that they will be a total package in terms of being key leaders. So these are just, this slide just shows the graduates of that program, some of them, uh, because after we had finished with this uh, capacity building, we then had them, um, we, of course, they were going through some assessments and after they had graduated, we had again another session where we also invited uh, the quadrapartite, the regional quadrapartite Africa CDC to come. And following that, it did not end there. We then challenged them to come up with proposals of what they are motivated to do after going through these sessions. So because of course, because of resource constraints, we then just gave a few of them some resources for them to actually do some way community engagement projects, some way research uh, projects that have actually been peer reviewed and published now. And they engaged in a lot of activities, including forming One Health student clubs in their different institutions. So just a few highlights of what we continue doing uh, is that because really this um, engagement of youth needs to be something sustainable that we keep doing. We do have annual My Turn events. These My Turn events, uh, of course, the word actually came from one of the youth champions that it's my turn. It's my turn to show something out. So what we do is we gather them in one uh, place where they come, we, we have them showcase what they've been doing in their different uh, institutions. And we do have categories of what they'll be showcasing. The people who have done research, some who have engaged in art, some who have done, say, community engagement activities, they come in. And we also award them prizes based on um, what they'll have. There to be a contest with adjudicators coming in. So we did have um, about two so far in Kenya for the two years. And then we this year, we're happy to go to Uganda. As I said, uh, for this program, actually, about 60% of the youth champions were from Uganda. So it was really good because what we also do is we build their capacity in these events. We make sure we invite the ministries in the country. So right from the Minister of Health with the One Health approach, Minister of Agriculture and Environment, they come in, they talk to the students, let them know what has been happening in their country and what role they can play. So it's actually very good when we have these mentor, uh, my turn events. In these photos, it's just showing a snip of um, some of the my ten events that we had. We also be, we also do poster presentations during them, these sessions. Another highlight of what we do is mentorship programs where we have uh, different experts in the AMR space sign up to be mentors. And then we connect them with the youth champions who will be needing mentorship, whether it's in mentors research or they just want to understand more about AMR. So we partner MNT and the mentors so that they work together. We also do quite a number of competitions apart from the My Turn event. We also have, we partner like just last year, we partnered with FAO to come up with an AMR and sustainable food systems competition. So the two winners are the ones you see at the bottom left there. They also attended our React Africa annual conference. So all these things actually motivate the youth to continue working on Meta's AMR as we build uh, their capacity. So we also um, make sure during WOW, like now, we engage the youth. Um, for example, here in Kenya, we, we actually coordinate a competition every year since I think 2018, where we actually have the students submit entries. Normally the categories will be on photo essay, short videos and drama, like the photo you see at the center, this was in 2019. The quadrapartite celebrations were actually done in Kenya, the regional uh, wow celebrations. So the team here you see was actually um, 
doing a skit, uh, raising awareness, very good one. We, they were using a one health approach and uh, making sure that even the farmers were co-opted in the skit, the policymakers and all. So the rest of these flyers just show some of what we do. And we always make sure we give them certificates to motivate the students. So, so some of the success stories have been that um, we have had students coming to do the um, skits like you're seeing now. This was a, a group in Uganda to your right who came in. They had the skits that they did uh, as a way of raising awareness through art. And then from that now, we managed to have them come for our annual conference. And just we are happy that uh, the Quadrapatite also invited them to Arare in Zimbabwe, where the same group of students are actually going to do their drama skits. And we'll see how best we can engage them further so that they raise awareness, not just in Uganda, where they are from, but we can see how all, in all countries we can utilize art. As you know, AMR is very difficult to be relatable. It's quite a challenge sometimes to break down the message, especially at the grassroots level. So such initiatives are good. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, then you see in that, um, if you see in this current slide, you realize that one of the students actually, they were bringing a live chicken into the one of our sessions, which was quite something that they take this very seriously, the my 10 events. So here they were trying to see the misuse of um, antimicrobials in the agricultural sector, what has been happening in the poultry uh, industry, where sometimes farmers just give uh, so antimicrobials where it's not necessary and sometimes for growth promotion. So it was a very good skit and they try and be as creative as possible. So this is always good when we are engaging the youth, they try it by all means to be creative. So um, what we have seen just to conclude on the success stories is that we, these students have gone on to form One Health Student Clubs. They have done so many innovative things. Like when you see in these photos, some have come up with football tournaments in their countries, in their communities, right in the remote areas where um, they actually raise awareness. They distribute pamphlets. The football contest start with them raising awareness amongst the youth that will be attending this uh, football tournament. And then they go on to then engage. So they come up with more like a league. So each time they attend, they are given an AMR message as they also participate in the football. So they have also done things like newsletters that have been uh, formed and initiated. So we have seen, and the good part is they are innovative, even without any budget for IEC materials, they simply write messages on there. The next one also just shows a bit of highlights of the work they've been doing. Some have been doing videos during COVID-19, some were even going as well into their different communities, just trying to put the message across. This has also happened even during this one week, we have had an overwhelming um, awareness uh, campaign where students and youth have gone out there to raise awareness. So, focusing now on the, this is again, just some, um, some of the testimonies coming out from these youth champions. One recently in August wrote a personal letter to Alexander Fleming saying your prediction came to be and you do not want to know what is happening. So such things, poetry and art are just really one of some of the things that these youth champions do. So what lessons have we learned uh, from this engagement we have done? What are some of the challenges we have faced? The lessons that we have learned um, as the first one is that collaboration is very important. Partnership and collaboration are important because you tend to then have um, a lot of mileage done if you do that. As I talked about in the first place that we always engage with the quadrupartite. We have even done joint competitions with them. We also engage with um, Africa CDC. And uh, recently the My 10 event I talked about in Uganda, we had collaboration with partners such as the International Livestock Research Institute, EURI. We had also support from the PAR Foundation who gave us some of the resources. And even in the last, um, in the last conference that uh, for the Global Health Network that Ryan referred to at the start, we also presented around this work. And we had, uh, so we had a publication out of that conference as well about mobilizing youth action in Africa. So it's always good because you then partner with various stakeholders and you synergize efforts and see how best to move forward. Another key lesson that we learned is that um, there's a key gap 
in the university and colleges uh, curricula, of course, right from the primary school level where nothing AMR is even talked about. So um, although the national action plans, like if you see, this is an example of Uganda, it actually explicitly states that um, there should be education that is done for the youth, create AMR courses for undergraduate and postgraduate health professionals. And also there are even uh, the fact that there is supposed to be some courses that should be ongoing as part of uh, CPD. But you'll notice from the, because each time we have the students gather, whether in virtual or physical, um, activities, we always ask, we always take some surveys so that we have uh, whatever interventions we are doing are also informed by the feedback we get. So one of the key feedbacks that always comes out is that AMR is not sufficiently covered in the curriculum at all. So even for the medical students, they feel maybe they'll just have two sessions from a lecturer that just talks about AMR, but they don't cover it in detail. Even the pharmacy medical students feel the same way. So the rest of the faculties do not even mention AMR. So it will be important as, a, as moving forward to make sure that um, we actually have advocates so that at least um, the ministries of education can also ensure that um, this is covered sufficiently in the various curriculum so that at least as the students are graduating, they also appreciate uh, and have better knowledge on AMR. I was also happy even when Ryan was speaking about the knowledge hub, how you make sure that um, as the global health network, there is research, um, a section where at least students can go to. So we will also, the students that we have in our program, we ensure we also lead them to that so that they can be able to see uh, what they can gain from this uh, knowledge hub that of course has a lot of uh, diverse resources because there is really a gap in terms of uh, just the capacity building. So inclusivity is very key. I saw in the chat that the Francophone region was even asking also whether they are included in some of the interventions that are done uh, by different stakeholders. So we also saw that when we launched our program, the one I talked about, the leadership program, we only targeted Anglophone countries. Um, and just one, we had one champion that came from uh, a Francophone country. So just this year, actually, we... We actually launched a similar program just a few months ago in partnership with Ajram from Burkina Faso, where we're just giving them support as they were launching a similar program, a leadership program, where they also brought in experts to talk to these youth champions um, different days. They were doing Saturday and Sunday. So it's important to include that part of Africa. So that one actually has 16 different uh, Francophone countries. There were more than 600 applications actually to this Francophone region uh, youth program, but 200 were selected because when now looking at uh, how the, the submission of the youth champions, what they were saying, how motivated they would be to act and all. So it's actually still ongoing. The one for the Francophone, they are still going through their um, phase two now after being sensitized of how best they can then engage their communities. And we also put into consideration in issues such as gender equality. We make sure when they engage the youth, there's representation female and male have to be equally represented. Like you'll see at the bottom there, it's one of the, when we had our Maitan event, the distribution in Uganda was 51% male, 49% female. So we try to ensure there's a balance. There are some students also, or youth champions coming from remote areas where sometimes they can't attend these events or they even don't have internet to connect. So we also take that into consideration so that no, we do not leave anyone behind, but we make sure that it it is inclusive. So that's one of the lessons we learned that we should have an inclusive approach and make sure that issues around equity, equality are also taken into consideration in AMR interventions. So these champions really need our support. Um, even from the audience here, yeah, if someone is passionate about supporting the youth, I think the organizations should continue. Uh, supporting these champions because we do get a lot of brilliant ideas. As I said, they've done research that's actually um, adding to the body of uh, evidence and knowledge. So their young champions who are outstanding, uh, have energy, are creative, they have unique perspectives, 
And they are very good at taking the lead in research, in innovation, in policy issues, and they are health champions that can actually contribute to engaging the communities, their fellow peers, so it will be important to engage them. And I'll just, um, as I get to the end of my presentation, as I said, it will be important um, that we acknowledge that the fight against AMR requires collective action. And I actually believe that um, by meaningfully engaging, empowering uh, the youth and offering them technical support, mentorship, financial support where we can to to enable them to, to facilitate um, some of the ideas that would, they'll be trying to do in small projects that target their communities. And working together without duplicating efforts, we can create a sustainable future where antimicrobials remain effective for the generations to come. So youth are very key in this uh, fight against AMR. Thank and you I'll so end much. With Thank you so much. That sounds... So I do have, sorry, Chifundo, just a minute to just give some two quotes from some of the champions who came to our sessions that I found very interesting. One is from Uganda who says, no action, talk only, NATO is not acceptable. So NATO, we shouldn't just talk, but we make sure we act. And Dr. Kabali from FAO then said, the reason why we should engage the youth is that they are not future leaders, They've got the future, our future in their hands, of course, but they're actually current leaders with a little bit more time. So make sure in our policies, in all that we do, we engage the youth because they'll be able to help us as we look forward to our future. Thank you and over to you, Chifundo. Absolutely brilliant work. Thank you for your presentation. That was amazing. I'm going to pass it on to Fozia. Thank you. For the interest of time, I will uh, move to the next with the Rwanda Biomedical Center as the One Health Specialist. Over to you. Um. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Um, I'm on a bus. That I'll not be able to put on my video, but I'm going to go through my slides real quick. So my name is Dr. Leandre Ishema, uh, and I said I'm from the uh, Rwanda Biomedical Center, which is the direct implementer of the Ministry of Health in Rwanda, and I serve as the One Health Specialist. Uh, so uh, on, uh, in this presentation, we are going to look at what we have done in terms of implementation of uh, the National Action Plan of um, Antimicrobial Resistance in Rwanda from a One Health perspective in humans, animals, and environment. Uh, we're going to look at our main achievements, what has worked well, some of the lessons we learned, and some of the challenges and how we're trying to uh, face them. The health system of Rwanda, uh, we have around uh, 52 hospitals, where some of them are districts, some are specialized, provincial, and also teaching hospitals. We also have health centers and health posts. Uh, and in animal health, we have uh, the uh, at the national level, the Rwanda Agriculture and the Animal Resources Board, which overlooks the animal health and sentinel sites throughout the country. So Rwanda developed its uh, first national action plan on antimicrobial resistance in 2020. And next year, we're going to review it and extend it. It had uh, around five strategic objectives. One of increasing national awareness and understanding of AMR through education and uh, training, strengthening the knowledge and evidence based uh, through uh, surveillance and research of antimicrobial resistance uh, for infection prevention and control, the third one was reducing the incidence and infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and IPC measures. Uh, the fourth one was optimizing the use of antimicrobial agents in humans and animals. And currently, uh, we're trying to also include uh, the environmental sector. The fifth one was to ensure, ensure sustainable investment in antimicrobial resistance through sustainable and equitable financing mechanism and research development. Um, in the implementation of our NAP, uh, we kind of started implementing uh, uh, this year. Uh, we started by conducting a baseline laboratory assessment of antibiotic resistant testing capacity and antimicrobial stewardship in some of the hospitals that had the capacity to, to test. Uh, and we developed a national antimicrobial resistant surveillance operational plan for from the um, baseline laboratory assessment and as other assessments we did. From there, we developed a national antimicrobial surveillance system 
uh, this system is integrated in the in under the IHS two, especially in the integrated diseases surveillance and response system. Um, after that, uh, we developed the national antimicrobial surveillance uh, stewardship guidelines um, for healthcare settings. Um, if I talk about the operational plan, the operational plan we developed it as a team of the human, animal, agriculture, and environmental sectors. But these guidelines, we started by the human zone because the stewardship guidelines are not going to be the same with uh, other sectors since implementation was different. But currently, we are fi finalizing the animal and environmental stewardship guidelines. And we also developed training materials for the surveillance and antimicrobial stewardship, which helped us train people at different levels from the country level to the district level. Um, talking about the laboratory assessment and the stewardship um, baseline assessments we did, uh, we did them to assess the status of infrastructure, human resource, um, as well as equipment in support of the surveillance. Uh, we also assessed the antimicrobial susceptibility testing capacity and supply chain in different healthcare settings. Um, we also collected and analyzed our retrospective data uh, so that we can align it with the current antimicrobial susceptibility testing. We wanted also to review the, stat the status and policies and guidelines on antimicrobial resistance as well as stewardship in the country. Um, if we look at our progress in the implementation of antimicrobial surveillance in Rwanda regarding multisectoral coordination, uh, we have different documents that guide the country. One of them is the uh, One Health policy, which was uh, developed in 2019 and approved by the Rwandan cabinet in 2021. We have the One Health uh, strategic plan We're on a second one, uh, which um, is from 21 to 2026, and it incorporates antimicrobial resistance. We have the National Action Plan for Antimicrobial Resistance expiring next year, and uh, we're going to review it. And we also have the National Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Operational Plan, as well as the ant Antimicrobial Stewardship Guidelines. This is the governance structure of Rwanda that helps us with um, antimicrobial resistance surveillance. Um, we have the One Health Office incorporated in the Office of the Prime Minister, where we have social clusters under that are uh, made by a board of different ministers uh, that are in the One Health concept. From there, we have a One Health multi-sectoral coordination mechanism, which is made by leaders from different sectors, and they are supported by the One Health secretary, which runs One Health in Rwanda every day. Um, in the implementation of antimicrobial resistance, um, the, a the antimicrobial resistance technical working group is one of the four technical working groups we currently have in the One Health um, uh, governance framework of Rwanda. Uh, in the implementation of um, um, the antimicrobial resistance surveillance, we've created uh, different sentinel sites in the human and animal uh, sectors. Uh, Rwanda is a country that has uh, five provinces. So in animal, uh, on the animal side, we've got four sentinel labs. These are satellite labs in four, uh, in four districts of Rwanda, and we have the National Veterinary Laboratory. Uh, these are the laboratories we've, gave, we've given the capacity to, uh, to do antimicrobial resistance surveillance, as well as antimicrobial susceptibility testing. In humans, we've got 11 hospitals, uh, as well as the National Reference Laboratory, which makes it a total of 18 laboratories throughout the country in humans and animals. Uh, these 11 hospitals are in different uh, provinces of the country. And the National Reference Laboratory is uh, in the city of Kigali. Um, one thing I mentioned that we have done to help us with surveillance of antimicrobial resistance was the uh, establishment of the national surveillance system. This national surveillance system helps us with surveillance in both humans and animals. Some of the steps we used um, in, uh, in the development of this surveillance system we first established a sub-technical technical, uh, sub -technical working group on surveillance, research, and laboratory strengthening. After that, we defined the surveillance objectives from different sectors so that we can include them. And we defined a strategy for implementation of this system. After that, we strengthened our national, uh, 
non-reference laboratories as well as the satellite laboratories I mentioned, and we adapted national protocols. As you can see, we have the National Integrated Surveillance System, which is hosted under DHS2, and uh, this is overlooked by the One Health platform. And reports come in from the human sentinel sites as well as animal sentinel sites. And soon we are trying to incorporate the environmental sentinel site as we are about to open an environmental laboratory. Uh, the reports go to the servers and uh, the people that are overlooking uh, this uh, surveillance system, they also give feedback of analyzed data to the different sentinel sites so that decisions can be made according to the data that is reported. Uh, some of the achievements we have, we have also, uh, we've also uh, prioritized the MDR pathogens in Rwanda. The strategies I mentioned, they, they, have been, um, they have been approved by different levels. We have developed different guidelines uh, for appropriate use of antimicrobials, uh, as well as antimicrobial stewardship programs. We have the access watch and reserve classification of antibiotics at different levels of the health sector in Rwanda, hospitals, as well as uh, sentinel sites in human in, and animal sector. As I mentioned, uh, the National Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance or Operational Plan incorporates the human, animal, uh, agriculture, and environmental sectors. Um, the guidelines for the animal and the, uh, agriculture and environment for stewardship are still under development, and they'll be finalized by the end of this year. Success stories in Rwanda, we have a strong multi-sectoral collaboration uh, through the One Health approach, as I've mentioned. We have a functional national action plan. We have the lab capacities in the laboratories I mentioned. Yeah, we are close to time. Let's move to the last slide so that I can show something small. Um, this slide, um, one of the success stories we have, we have an online antimicrobial stewardship course anyone can take. And this one, uh, we give certificates to anyone who attends it. And we have also trained people uh, in different hospitals on antimicrobial uh, surveillance, on antimicrobial resistance surveillance as on antimicrobial stewardship. We've also tested people in different laboratories as mentioned in this slide. It's a slide that shows how samples in Rwanda, uh, since all of the hospitals don't have the capacities, the hospitals in red, as well as the sentinel sites in human, uh, in animal, uh, on the animal side, they're the ones that have the capacity to test. And this is how they test for other uh, hospitals and sentinel sites around them. And we are planning to increase the sentinel sites to 25 by the end of next year, um, uh, which will change this whole structure. Thank you so much for the sake of time. I cannot continue presenting. Uh, thank you to the CDC team for, uh, for this opportunity. And thank you um, to everyone that attended this presentation. Wow, thank you so much for keeping time. We really do appreciate. Um, let me now um, hand over to Dr. Chifondo for the next speaker. Thank you. I will be introducing our next speaker, Dr. Maris Nanyonga. Um, she is a Ugandan clinical pharmacist and a clinical epidemiologist. Her work represents the convergence of clinical pharmacology, epidemiology, and public health policy. Currently, she's pursuing a Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Medicine at the University of Oxford, where her research focuses on critical issues countering substandard and falsified um, antimicrobials within the framework of national action plans against antimicrobial resistance in the Sub-Saharan African region. Um, thank you, Dr. Stella, over to you. Um, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to present the work we have done in Uganda. And um, I'm the principal investigator of this project, and this is my study team. So uh, wh why we, we, we embarked on this project, uh, Uganda uh, has a big uh, private retail sector, uh, which has improved access to essential medicines. And these medicines are access to the pharmacies, the hospitals, the drug shops, and there are still some vendors. However, community pharmacies have been said to be the first point of contact for patients with the healthcare system. And so we channeled our energies to this. Uh, though Uganda also has a high prevalence of self-medication, which are in part is fueled by the unregulated access to antimicrobials, 
I saw Molenga Ransa from Zambia commenting about the fact that we have not tackled the consumer during this uh, webinar, and I'm here to tackle the consumer aspect of, uh, of AMR. And uh, we know that antibiotics are prescription-only medicines, but they are being accessed over the counter, and yet we know the inappropriate use of antimicrobials is really a driver of AMR. And on the left, you see an example of what patients walk into the pharmacy with. Number three is supposed to be ciprofloxacin, and this patient is buying a dose for a day so that we'll get them a tablet or two. And this is very common in the pharmacies. So in Uganda and world over, there are numerous efforts to curb uh, antimicrobial resistance through uh, many stewardship efforts. But these are mainly in the public sector and in the inpatient safety uh, setting, and there is little effort in the private sector, especially in the outpatient setting. And among the people who visit uh, the outpatient uh, setting, most patients come with upper respiratory tract infections. And so uh, we felt this is an area we can use uh, to get an entry into the stewardship in the private sector. And we all know upper respiratory tract infections are usually viral, some are allergic, and a few are bacterial, but uh, all these patients get antibiotics, yet most of the treatment should be over-the-counter treatment. And uh, there is no documentation of uh, antimicrobial stewardship efforts in community pharmacies in Uganda, so we decided to embark on this project. So our study was set in the central part of Uganda, in Kampala and Pijan Wachiso district, which represents the urban, peri-urban, and then the rural setting in Uganda. And so we had three districts with 128 participating pharmacies. Uh, this is a before and after study with 65 interventional sites and 64 control sites. Uh, we had a quantitative arm to this study, which had a cross-sectional uh, study. And uh, our sample size was calculated based on the patients who visit pharmacies with upper respiratory tract infections. And we also had a qualitative arm to this study with 21 key informant interviews and 10 focus group discussions. So we started off with the qualitative study, which was the formative research bit of our study. And here we interfaced with the pharmacy workers, with community health workers, mothers with four children, the urban poor, uh, religious leaders and local village leaders, women's groups. And from here, we asked, why do they use antibiotics? Or why don't they use antibiotics? And we also asked which intervention at a pharmacy level uh, would be uh, feasible for them to, to scale back the use of antibiotics. We also had prescribers in the catchment areas of these pharmacies are uh, included in this. And we came up with nine interventions, which the people agreed that can work in the community pharmacy setting. We had a training for pharmacy staff, pharmacy owners, the media, local prescribers, local leaders, uh, posters and flyers on AMR and URTIs, patient counseling and education, reference materials that, like the Uganda Clinical Guidelines and the BNF, referral pathways, algorithms for managing upper respiratory tract infections, alternative treatment, patient follow-up, and then delayed prescriptions. So we started our intervention period, which is a six-month period. And we started it off with a training. We involved peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, it, was, it also had a classroom kind of setting. And we broke up the groups into those who could understand English and those who could understand the local language. And we, the training for those who don't understand the local language was delivered in Luganda. Uh, also the flyers, we translated them to Luganda. We had one on antibiotics, and uh, this is the one, and we had another on managing upper respiratory tract infections and home remedies and when to actually go and see a, a health worker. And the posters were also developed both in English and the local language and displayed in the different intervention pharmacies. And we had baseline as, and a baseline assessment before we started the interventions. And here we found that patients who come in with a, an upper res respiratory tract infections have a high level of self-medication at 95%, but this is expected since these are self-limiting illnesses or should be self-limiting illnesses. However, 85% actually wanted an antibiotic and half of these actually did receive an antibiotic. And when we assessed 93% of those who received an antibiotic did not actually need it. And most of them received azithromycin. And this should remind us that during the COVID pandemic, people learned to use azithromycin and it seems this trend has continued. And uh, only 28% of these patients could differentiate between an antibiotic and any other kind of drugs. And uh, when we looked at the pharmacy staff, I will not uh, labor to explain uh, the, the result, but I'll draw your attention to the fact that 51%, which is the last bullet down, 
of the pharmacy as staff actually said they do alter the patient's prescription when the patient comes into the pharmacy. But the pharmacy staff have actually been, uh, have not received enough training. They are aware of the treatment guidelines for upper respiratory tract infections in Uganda. And they also agreed that they actually have heard a bit about uh, antimicrobial resistance and they know what causes it. So when you look at the cadre of staff we have working in the pharmacies, we have people like orthopedic officers, anesthetic officers who should not be in the pharmacy. But also you can see that majority of the staff are nurses, but remember 51% of the staff agreed that they are going to change a, a prescription. So if the specialist, the ENT, the consultant is prescribing, keep in mind that at the end of the chain, there's a nurse who could be changing your prescription. So when we asked for the enablers of antibiotic overuse, the pharmacy staff said, they don't know about AMR, uh, it's also an issue. And then there's con short consultation time at the pharmacy. Uh, there's a high patient demand for antibiotics. Uh, there are drug promoters who give them incentives and then they wish they had uh, di diagnostics at the pharmacy because this makes them just give a blind treatment. And at the end of the day, this is a business and they have to make a sale. And for the patients still, they do not know about AMR. And then there's poverty, so people cannot afford to be sick. So they will hit fast and hit hard with uh, antibiotics, not to get sick. And then uh, there's internet-derived diagnosis. So the patients feel like they can Google their symptoms, Google their treatment, and they are able to tell you what they need and they, they think this should be okay. And then also the patients believe that going to a health facility is time-wasting and they prefer to get their medication from the pharmacy. Also, the patients, this came out very strongly. They've uh, used this medicine before, they've had this sickness before, so they feel they are the expert at their condition, and they actually are, and they feel that they know how they manage, they should manage their condition. But when we asked, okay, what can be done different for us not to overuse antibiotics? Uh, the pharmacy staff said if they know any alternative treatment, and these are actually available and stocked at the pharmacy, it helps because at the end of the day, the patient has to work out with something. Then there is also a gap in clinical knowledge. If they knew uh, much more about the diseases and the, the, the conditions they are managing, they'll do a better job. And then they confess that every time they get a chance to discuss with the patient, to educate the patient, the patient demand for antibiotics actually goes down. And then they also said when they get opportunities for training and awareness, they actually learn something that they can implement. And also when they have a longer time with the patient, they are able to explain to the patient properly and the patient will accept uh, their intervention. And for the community, uh, they said when they are diagnostic tests at the government facility, and then they are able to, to know whether they'll need an antibiotic or not. And also when the pharmacy has alternative medication for their condition, even if it's not an antibiotic, they feel happy that they are working away with treatment. And of course they wish they knew more about AMR and, and antibiotics. And also they said that the fact that they walk into a pharmacy and they're able to get an antibiotic uh, makes them use it. But every time they walk into a pharmacy and they tell them you can't get this without a prescription, they've actually listened to the health worker who is advising. And so we conducted a midterm assessment to see how is this uh, panning out. And uh, one intervention pharmacy had closed. Uh, what is very interesting, only half of the intervention pharmacies have shown interest in this study and are, are returning to us uh, the, the monitoring tool. But we've had uh, 1,353 patient engagements, and this is very good. And uh, all these patients, 72%, uh, have received a fly about AMR or uh, upper respiratory tract infections. But you can already see that the demand for the number of patients who have received an antibiotic has gone down from 49 to 34%. Uh, unfortunately, we had zero delayed prescriptions from the clinicians, and I could write a book about uh, these delayed prescriptions. And 70% uh, of these high health workers actually used the algorithm we gave them to determine if this patient needs an antibiotic or referral or something else. We've had 138 referrals. And as you can see, one of the reasons for these referrals is sus suspected TB. This means that we actually need infection prevention and control at the pharmacy. IPC is in the inpatient setting, but as we can see, there's also a problem at the pharmacy. And we've had 522 patient follow-ups since the patients had complained that in the pharmacy, there is no form of follow-up. They just walk off, get worse, and no one cares. So we actually tried with the follow-up and it worked. And so uh, to discuss these results, I will first tell you this, that 
people often have very rational reasons for using medicines irrationally. Uh, one of the participants told us that every time they get soaked in the rain, they have to take an anti-malaria and an antibiotic because usually they get a fever and they, they need to stop this. So the moment they are soaked in the rain, they immediately get the antibiotic and anti-malaria. They have a very rational reason for doing something irrationally. So from all this we have discussed today, one thing has come out very clearly, there is a high demand for an antibiotic. If only 28% of the patients knew what an antibiotic is and could differentiate it from other, other drugs, that is very alarming. Other studies have shown that patients usually look at their medication, but the one which is most expensive is always assumed to be the antibiotic. So we need more awareness about around this. And then the use of medicine uh, is not really related to medical necessity. People just want to get some medicine because it's a quick fix. When you suspect you're going to get sick, when you feel sickness is coming on, it's a quick fix because they do not want to get a test. They do not want to fall sick. But also a cultural perspective to medicine has come out. In Uganda, there's a disease called Kavotongo, which uh, in my assessment is congenital syphilis. So once someone is told they have this, they will accept any medicine and for any amount of time because people believe it's, it, it has no cure and you have to take medicine. But this is given for everything, a uh, nail fungal infection, uh, any cough you have kavotong and people will actually accept. So there is a need to work around these myths. And also there's a social economic factor. The pharmacies need to make a sale. So if we tell them you don't give an antibiotic, yet we all know that antibiotics are, are cost a lot. We need to really sit with them and, and, and discuss this uh, in detail. But there's the biggest demand is, uh, the biggest problem is the public expectations. The health worker is judged from the number of pills they are able to give. And if you don't give the pills, the patient will walk to the next pharmacy and assume that you do not know uh, what you're doing. So we really need to address this demand for antibiotics. So what challenges have we experienced trying to uh, implement antimicrobial stewardship? in a private setting and in the community pharmacy setting, uh, there are no prescriptions coming in. So when you tell the pharmacy give a medicine only when there's a prescription, it means they're not going to sell. We have uh, dispensing doctors, they prescribe and, dis and dispense, and this needs to be addressed. If the pharmacies are not get getting prescriptions, antibiotics will continue to be uh, over the counter uh, medication. There is no follow up. So when the patient leaves, they will just walk into the next pharmacy, whether they get a better or not. And this also has filled the delayed prescription, same as having no referral system. You don't know even if you refer a patient, they will not go to the doctor, they walk to the next pharmacy and still buy the antibiotic because we do not have a referral system in, the, in, our, in our setting. As uh, still the fact that it's a sale versus professionalism. If at the end of the day, I have to keep my job and make sales, you're not going to tell me not to give out these antibiotics. But the fact that we introduced the alternative medication has helped and people say, sometimes they actually make more sales from the alternative medication than they would have when they were given the antibiotic. And this is very positive feedback. And then these patients in the community setting come from different uh, uh, attachments because we track where the patient came from and most patients are driving through in some of these pharmacies. So even if you have the intervention in this catchment area, it's not necessarily that your patients are coming from that catchment area. And then lastly, the pharmacy owners are not interested in participating in something like this because it affects their sales and they also believe uh, it's a scheme to catch them and then take away their licenses that they are doing the wrong thing. But what lessons have we learned and we can share with other people Antimicrobial stewardship is actually possible in the private sector, especially in the community pharmacy, and it's way overdue. We should be doing this. And we need to do IPC in these community pharmacies. However, trust is very important. Our pharmacy owners have failed to trust us. They believe this is a way to catch them out. And trust is very important to establish between our, our people who they view as regulators and these pharmacy owners if we are, we are to get a high level of professionalism. And then uh, each patient contacted or each patient that we give medication is a missed opportunity if we don't tell them about antibiotics. And why is this so? Because if you notice the patients uh, used medication they have used before or a family members used before. So if every time we give them an antibiotic, we tell them about AMR, then they will tell the person they are giving these antibiotics to the same message. And community involvement is key. The community was really very happy that we called them and, and told them about the study and about all these dangers. And they are happy when they receive the flyers at the pharmacy. 
telling them about AMR and, and what to do when they have a, an upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, we really need to address the demand for antibiotics. If the competence of a health worker is measured by the pills are dispensed, then really we are, we are fighting a very large battle and we need to address this from the roots, which is the patient and the community. And today I want to leave you with one question. Can we really optimize the use of antimicrobials without addressing the high demand for antibiotics? And for me, the answer is no, I do not know what your answer is. Uh, this study was funded by Pfizer Global Medical Grants. And I also want to thank the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda for giving us a platform to do this work. And to also thank the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, which gave us a very generous donation of DNFs for our intervention sites, and the community pharmacies in Uganda and the districts of Kampala, Wachiso, and PG. And I really want to thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Um, Stella, for the insightful presentation and your findings on um, the context in African communities. Um, especially in regards to the theme for this symposium and the general region. I'm going to open the floor up for questions and answers. And right off the bat, there is a few questions for you. I'll give you all the questions at once so you answer them. We're running short of time. So the first question is, Dr. Stella, studies have shown communities depend on antibiotics for quick fixes. What alternatives can be offered for such people? And the second one is, how can we effectively tackle AMR problems in a scenario where local funding is unavailable, hospitals are unwilling to cooperate? Um, where to start? How can the Global Health Network help uh, research scholars like me to work on AMR in difficult contexts? Um, another person has said, thank you, Dr. Sell, for the presentation. How do we ensure that we have AMR champions in different regions in Uganda? Um, uh, thank you for the questions. I will start with the alternatives. Unfortunately, I can't see my question. So if you can repeat the question on alternatives, please. What alternatives do we have for antibiotics? This was asked twice. Oh, yes, uh, and thank then... you. The alternatives are for the management of upper respiratory tract infections, which are not caused by a bacteria. So we have alternatives, which are the pain management, uh, management antipyretics to manage the fever. We have the herbal syrups, which suit the throat. So basically we manage the symptoms and the symptoms are usually a sore throat, pain, fever, to soothe uh, the throat until the body immunity fights the disease because some of these are viral, some of these are allergic. So we give the anti-allergy medication. We actually have a whole protocol showing the alternative medication for each of these. Uh, the other question is, how do we get champions across Uganda? In hospitals, we actually have champions across Uganda in the government setting because the system is there. At the regional referral hospital, there's a medicine and therapeutics committee and the pharmacist is the champion in the region. But in the private sector, we do not have these champions. But uh, the civil societies like TEPS Uganda, DUMAKE, they are actually putting up these champions. But it's a bit fragmented at the moment because we all know the funding for the private setting is different for the pub than the public setting. Thank you. Is there a question I have missed? No. Um, thank you very much. Next question. Next thank questions you. are for Dr. Emiliana. Um, just a second. <laughs> Dr. Emiliana Francis. How what can be the possible cause for increases in trends of AMR in Tanzania? Is this because of community factors or healthcare factors? Thank you, Madam Chifundo. Uh, as I presented on the AMR data, we have seen all of all of us that the trend of AMR data is decreasing yearly instead of increasing. We have seen the trend of AMR data, uh, the AMC data from 2017 to 2022, that there is a significant decrease of uh, DDD, uh, of the DDD measure as per country level. So as all we know that the, the MR is directly proportional on the AM, AMC. So we, 
I can say that we are not increasing on the AMR rather than we are decreasing the AMR situation in the country. But on answering the question, the, I think it is uh, the contribution maybe of the community or the, the, the community related to public or the, the, the community related to private sector and the government sector on the on the AMR. Uh, on, the, on the minor analysis of the AMC data, it showed that the most of the consumption of AMR of, of, uh, of antimicrobials are from the private sector. So the private sector is the one which is contributing on the, is highly contributing on the AMR in the country compared to the public sector. Thank you. Thank you. I have two more questions in general. I think these will probably be for Ryan. Um, how can the Global Health Network help research scholars like me to work on AMR in difficult contexts where local funding is unavailable and hospitals are unwilling to cooperate? But also for the rest of our panelists, I think because we, you all work in difficult scenarios like this as well. Thanks, Jufando. I'm definitely happy to comment and I do have some thoughts, but I agree. I think if the other panelists who, again, work more directly in these scenarios have any comments, it'd be great to hear from them as well. So Emiliana, Stella, uh, Julian, I don't know if you have any comments on that first. If not, I will make the comment that this is absolutely something that we hear from our members all the time from across every part of the globe as well so not just restricted to africa but from our colleagues in latin america and from our colleagues in asia too um the challenge of not just accessing uh domestic funding but also getting not the political will but the institutional will and the institutional support and also protected time to uh, conduct a lot of these AMR activities and dedicated AMR research. My focus would be on the value of collaboration here. There is strength in numbers, right? Um, and we can get advocacy through that collaboration and through strong research networks and strong support networks. So again, this is exactly the sort of thing that we're trying to support at the Global Health Network going forward. So I mentioned the working groups earlier, and one of their focuses will absolutely be on AMR stewardship and supporting the implementation of AMR stewardship guidelines in more challenging settings, hospitals, uh, other institutions. And that's exactly something that we're hoping to focus on. So I really think here, again, as part of, part of the key message behind um while week uh, antimicrobial awareness week at the moment is one of collaboration and i think collaboration strength in numbers and advocacy as communities and networks is really really key to taking this forwards so i think we have a very strong platform here across all of the different groups represented to really use this as a jumping off point and take things forwards going forwards so yes keep in touch get involved i think is is my message there mm -hmm. My last question goes to Julian, then we'll close up. How do we integrate the environmental health professionals in the fight against antimicrobial resistance? I have not seen any stewardship data in relation to that. Yeah, so thank you so much. Just speaking on what uh, Ryan had said earlier, I was trying to unmute. Um, I think for sure this is there's opportunity in collaboration, just speaking on what he has said. And it's very timely since uh, next year, as you know, the UN uh, General Assembly, there's a high level meeting on AMR that is happening in 2024. So it's important that the voices for all these challenges, the guidelines you talked about, the funding challenges, the political will, these are challenges we see in Africa. As I mentioned uh, at the start that React Africa works to support countries in implementation of their national action plans. So it will be important to advocate so that moving on from the political declaration in 2016, what have we achieved? The, some of these challenges still remain. And the, for them to, the voice to be amplified, it means us, it needs us to work together power of partnership collaboration, just reiterating on Ryan's point. Then speaking to environment, um, I think my comment there would be that uh, there's progress, which is a good thing for the One Health. Um, as you know, just um, last year, 
the quadripartite. Now UNEP um, actively involved in AMR issues. We had the commemoration just here in Kenya where we had uh, UNEP uh, represented speaking to how they want to incorporate the environment. So right from the regional level, it's good that that is happening. So coming, going down to the national level, the Ministry of Environment is lagging behind in a sense in most countries. That's what I would say in Meta's AMR because every year we do have an annual conference where we have representation from different African countries. So you'll notice that that is one sector where for the national plan action plans, uh, the vision 1.0, some of them did not even include them. Where they were included, it was just in paper. But the good part is we are moving towards uh, having the environmental sector incorporated right from the regional level, the country level, the Minister of Environment coming on to be actively engaged. So of course, even meta surveillance, we hope, of course, for now, the data very, there's really not much on the environment sector, but the good part is their efforts to incorporate them. So if you look at, I don't know which country the person who asked was from, but the good part is earlier in the year when we had our annual conference, we had quite a number of uh, delegates presenting from the Ministry of Environment and also shedding light on what they've been doing in their countries. So the good part is we are on the right way to go there. And we are also deliberate, like for speaking for the youth program, for example, there are some students that are actually in, uh, studying environment uh, studies um, that are actually, in Kenya here, the quadrupartite representative studied environment for the youth um, leadership team, which is actually good because uh, now we are making sure we are more deliberate because of course it's acknowledged that the environmental sector has been lagging behind. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, everyone for your insights and brilliant presentations today. And thank you everyone for joining. I will be passing it on to my colleague, Fosia, to give us closing remarks. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. And I really wanted to mention something to the last uh, question that Lillian has touched on. Um, as Africa CDC, currently we are championing um, for the One Health multi-sectoral coordination mechanism at a country level. And we have launched the One Health framework for national public health institutes. And at continental level, we're trying to map how many countries have that strong One Health coordination mechanism. I know we closely work with all our member state countries, Emiliana, and we can attest to that. And this is something that we're really looking forward to. So um, hopefully next year, a time like this, we'll have good answers. We need all the line ministries to be involved when it comes to um, combating antimicrobial resistance. Shouldn't just be the animal health sector. So uh, thank you so much once again to all of us. And moving to the closure, um, I really enjoyed. Uh, this was an impactful uh, webinar on AMR in Africa. Um, Gratitude to all the speakers, participants, contributors for making this event a success. Um, we've touched on so many things, including surveillance system in, in Tanzania, youth engagement, uh, Rwanda's One Health approach, um, optimizing AMR use, antimicrobial use, sorry, in management of um, upper respiratory tract. Um, um, experience from Uganda. So all these presentations honestly underscore um, the urgency and the complexity of AMR while offering hope to innovative strategies and community engagement. Um, just to pass and on and say that Africa CDC, uh, Africa Union, we are really committed in mitigating AMR in the continent and we don't want to leave anyone behind. That is why we're trying to look into how many, okay, almost all countries right now have um, the national action plan, but what is the implementation progress so far? Um, we are looking into concerted action among policymakers, healthcare professionals, researchers, educators, communities. Through all this, we can strengthen surveillance, uh, raise public awareness, promote responsible use of antimicrobials, and also invest in research, which are really crucial stuff in the continent. As Julian also has mentioned, next year we are going to have the high level. Um, meeting on antimicrobial resistance at the United Nations General Assembly. And hopefully we're going to see how we're going to present as one, the African continent, especially um, our common position on antimicrobial resistance, something that currently uh, Africa CDC, Africa Union is spearheading with our partners, of course. Um, so I would like to say, um, let's carry forward um, this discussion. Let's continue fostering partnerships um, to comprehensively address AMR in the continent. And let's ensure a healthy and sustainable future for all 
of our people in the continent as well. Um, I really want to thank all of you, to everyone who has participated, who has contributed, and also the organizers. It wasn't easy, it's been like a back and forth for some weeks now. And the one thing I would like to say is hopefully we, this is just a continuation. We're not just ending it at this AMR Awareness Week. Hopefully next year we're going to have more and more webinars, but now sector focus. Like, are we discussing research? Are we going to discuss just national action plan progress or implementation? Like things like that. But for this, I really say it was insightful and really, um, I really thank you all. And let's continue this vital conversation beyond this webinar. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Thank bye, you, everyone. Bye-bye.